We're going to speak about uh, some varieties of auctions to get a sense for the richness of the space. Because we often think about auctions about something as something very specific. But in fact, auctions are very broad. An auction is any mechanism that allocates resources, typically scarce resources, among agents who have their own interests. And the, we know of many examples. The governed sale of whether it's the electric, electromagnetical spectrum or uh, mineral rights, uh, drilling rights for oil, what have you, privatization of national assets, uh, those are all typically put to bid in one way or another. Stock markets are very famous, two-sided uh, auction where there are many buyers and sellers. RFQs or requests for co quotes are a standard mechanism for a company or a government to solicit offers to s supply them with uh, goods or services at the most attractive terms. These are often called reverse auctions. We already mentioned the FCC spectrum auction by way of uh, uh, sale of uh, national resources. Real estate uh, sales are often conducted on some kind of tender or bid basis where multiple people offer, uh, uh, make offers and, uh, according to certain rules. And certainly consumer-based uh, uh, auctions such as the ones conducted on eBay are very famous where everything uh, from uh, uh, cars to uh, to old CDs are uh, are sold. There are many other examples, and um, we should bear in mind that often uh, the uh, goods being sold are are uh, not necessarily the uh, standard uh, ones you think of in auctions. As a computer scientist, uh, I should point out uh, many applications of auction in a computing environments. So for example, network bandwidth is a scarce resource and uh, there is an opportunity to uh, uh, auction off the right to use bandwidth uh, to highest bidders. In um, uh, advertising auctions, famously on Google and other advertising uh, platforms, uh, advertisers bid for the right to present us with certain uh, offers uh, when we uh, search for certain keywords or even when we just uh, browse certain web pages there are display advertising and they too are uh, open for for bid there are peer to peer networks and many other applications in the uh, computing environment so what are the uh, kind of auctions we see in fact the space of auctions is infinite here are some examples that begin to illustrate the richness of the space. So we'll go over those in, in, in order. The English auction, the Japanese, the Dutch, the first price sealed bid auction, and the second price sealed bid auction, and finally the all pay auction. So let's go over those in turn. The English auction is probably the most familiar format. Uh, this is the sort of thing that in uh, art, uh, auction houses, uh, uh, a mechanism used there. So auctioneers start with some initial uh, price, often called the reservation or the reserve price. And bidders in the auction shout ascending prices. And at some point they stop shouting, the auctioneer may try to cajole them into uh, uh, suggesting high prices, but at some point the, uh, nobody says anything at that point, the auction is closed and the highest bidder wins the good at that price. The Japanese auction uh, is a less common term, but it's uh, similar to the English auction in that it's an open outcry auction and the price ascends, except here it's the auctioneer that calls out the prices. Uh, whether uh, explicitly or by some mechanism like a clock that just continuously rises. And think of all the bidders as being in to begin with. They're all standing there and maybe the auction starts at zero dollars for a television and everybody says, I'm in. And then the price starts to uh, rise slowly and uh, at some point, uh, bidders decide the price is too high for them and they sit down, they're out of the auction. And this is irrevocable. Once they sit down, they cannot stand back up. 
And when you have only one uh, bidder left standing, they get the good at that, uh, at that price. Um, this is very similar to the uh, English auction. Uh, it's uh, a little easier to analyze, uh, among other things, because the price does rise continuously and the, you don't have what you call jump bids, where somebody suddenly uh, offers a price that's much higher than the current uh, price. And, um, and uh, if you want to think about it in terms of a game representation, uh, you can imagine that in the English auction, at every point in the game, you have many branches uh, corresponding to the different sort of uh, increases or jump bids one could give. Whereas here, the game evolves in a uh, very, in a, in a single predictable way. That is the uh, auction that's often called the Japanese auction. And staying on uh, the international theme, we have the Dutch auction. Uh, this is a more standard uh, term, and it's uh, so-called because this is in fact the mechanism that to this day is used in the Dutch flower market. So how does the Dutch auction work? This is a descending auction. Like in the Japanese auction, it's the auctioneer that calls out prices, again, whether explicitly or by a mechanism. And in fact, in the Dutch flower market, it's a clock that starts at that everybody can look at and starts at a high price and gradually goes down. And at some point, the bidder claims the, the, uh, the object, uh, say the flower palette, by shouting mine, or as it's the case in the uh, Dutch flower market, hitting a buzzer. And when they, they get it, uh, they, when they hit it, they get that uh, good for that price. So you can think of it as a game of chicken Obviously, everybody would like to get the, uh, the good at the lowest possible price, but if they wait too long, somebody could uh, beat them to the punch. This is the Dutch auction. Moving on to seal bid auctions, um, we, uh, we get off the international theme. Uh, these are called sealed bid auctions uh, because unlike the ones we've discussed so far, there's no open outcry, but imagine that everybody writes a, an offer, a bid, uh, on a piece of paper and seals it in an envelope and hands it to the auctioneer. And the auctioneer uh, opens the envelope at the same time and, and then, then, then decides what the outcome of the auction is. And here are two examples of how this might happen. The most common auction is the first price auction or first price sealed bid auction. So in this case, the auctioneer uh, picks the bidder with the highest price as the winner and have them pay their price. Seems very straightforward and a very common mechanism. Second price auction is almost the same. It's again the highest person who bid uh, who wins the auction but they don't pay what they wrote down. They pay what the highest rejected bid, or the second highest bid is. And you might scratch your head for a moment to say, why would I want to do this? For example, if I want to maximize my revenue as a seller, surely I'd get less money if I did a second price. But when you think about it, the answer isn't so simple, because by changing the rules of the auction, people would bid differently. In fact, there's a famous result called the Revenue Equivalence Theorem that shows that under certain conditions, many auction formats that look very different, in particular the first and second price sealed bid auctions, actually in expectation fetch the same uh, price. Here for variety is a very different uh, sort of auction and uh, it's the old pay auction. And so you have a good for sale, and um, oh, maybe uh, the good is a um, maybe the good is a twenty dollar bill. Now imagine that I auction off this twenty dollar bill, and here are the rules: if you bid in the auction, you can write down any amount you want on a piece of paper, and if you're the highest guy, and, and the highest guy will win the auction. So if you write down $3, and if you're the highest guy, you'll get this $20 bill for $3. If you lost, you will still have to pay your bid. That's why it's called an all-pay auction. 
And now think for a moment, what would you bid in such an auction? Surely it's so tempting, you'd want to bid something, wouldn't you bid at least a dollar for the right to, uh, to win this uh, $20 bill? What happens if this wasn't a sealed bid auction, but an ascending auction? And uh, people could uh, bid a dollar, and then somebody could bid uh, two dollars. How would you behave in this auction? So we've seen several auction types now. The English, Japanese, the Dutch, the sealed bid auctions, the old pay auction. And this might suggest that to understand the space of auctions, you should enumerate the different auction types and study them. But in fact, the space of auctions is, is infinite. In, an auction is simply a negotiation mechanism that um, is first uh, market-based. So that means that there is some set of rules that govern it and uh, typically involve some sort of currency uh, of the marketplace, for example, money. It's mediated by a central authority, the auctioneer, and it has very well-defined rules um, that everybody goes by and everybody knows that everybody goes by their common knowledge. And there are three kind of rules that we need to specify it in order to specify an auction. There are the bidding rules, there are the information rules, and there are the market clearing rules. And if you specify those, you specify the auction. So what do we mean by bidding rules? We really mean who can bid, when they bid, what they can bid, and some restrictions. Uh, there are, um, you know, uh, for example, in an, uh, in an ascended bid auction, I have to bid the current highest price. In other auctions, I have to bid my own uh, price. Uh, we may not allow people to bid arbitrarily high. We, we may put some budget constraints. Uh, bids may have expiration dates. Uh, they may, uh, may be subject to withdrawals or not, and so on and so forth. So these are all the bidding rules. Very importantly are the information disclosure rules. And, for example, in a sealed bid auction, uh, we, uh, we, we, uh, when I bid, you don't see my bid. But do you know that I bid already? That's a very important information from you. Do you know who are the set of people who might be bidding? So information dissemination here is very critical to the marketplace and has to be explicitly specified. And finally, when all is said and done, the bidding is done based on information that uh, agents do and don't have, you need to clear the market. And the market clearing rules are also uh, multifaceted. There's a the question of when to clear. For example, uh, you might clear the markets many times. If you have multiple goods, you may uh, clear the market once and a certain set of goods will be sold and clear again in another set and so on. You might, uh, for example, decide when to clear based on activities. And so in some of the online auctions, you'll see that the auction ends at noon or after uh, a period of 10 minutes of inactivity, that is 10 minutes during which nobody placed any bid, whichever is later. It's a very interesting market uh, clearing uh, rule. So that's, the, that's regarding the timing, then the allocation and the payment. In other words, you've cleared the market, you need to say, who got what, who got, for example, in the case of a single good, who got the Van Gogh, and who pays what. As we've seen, it may not only be the person who won who pays. For example, in an all-pay auction, everybody who bid pays. Once we specified all of that, we specified the auction, and we're done.